to our talk this evening. I'm particularly welcome to those of us, those of you who attended our AGM yesterday, very successful AGM yesterday. Um, I'm Michael Clegg. I'm the uh, Secretary of Cambridge for Europe. We've got James Ball talking to us tonight. James is going to talk for um, about 30 minutes um, to be followed by uh, 30 minutes or so of questions. If you'd like to uh, ask a question, then can you put it in the Zoom chat, please? Um, helpfully, it's helpful if you label it as question at the start as well, um, just so we can tell what are questions and what's the, uh, what's the general chat and reaction. Um, We'll keep everybody on mute uh, to make sure we don't get any background interference. Um, so if you are, we, we've got uh, a couple of people, uh, Paul here, our chair, um, and Mary, uh, Mary Jennings, one of our committee members will be helping to coordinate questions and can read out your questions. If you've got a real burning desire to read your own question, then perhaps you could put that in the chat as well. Um, but it probably helps the flow on the whole um, if we can uh, if we can read your questions out for you. So thanks for that. OK, so um, if I could just introduce James before I hand him over, many of you hand over to him. Sorry. Many of you may well know James through his regular column in The New European. Uh, prior to, to, to that, uh, James worked as special projects editor at The Guardian where he played a key role in the Pulitzer Prize winning coverage of the National Security Agency leaks by Edward Snowden. Uh, James's day job now is as the global editor of the not-for-profit Bureau of Investigative, Journalists, of Investigative Journalism. His previous books include Post-Truth Post and Bluffocracy, but he's here tonight to talk on the theme of his most recent publication, The System, Who Owns the Internet and How It Owns Us. So on the assumption that they're not listening to us, James, uh, take it away. <laughs> so, um, well, you know, it's always nice to have a broader audience. So to uh, any spy agencies who have caught the lucky gig of getting to join us on this talk, hi. Um, thanks so much for inviting me and uh, hope that you enjoy what I'm going to talk about. Just to flag, you may see me having a sip of Diet Coke. That's not a sponsored content thing. You may also spot a cat jump into the camera as a shot at some point. That very much is. Um, but uh, I do apologise for either event in advance. Um, to sort of get on to what I kind of want to talk about, um, it can sound quite odd to say who owns the internet. You know, what does that even mean? Um, the internet's infrastructure these days, and especially after a year like the one we've had, um, I think most of us are probably quite glad it's there maybe more than we have been for a few years when we've had all these issues of misinformation and polarization and all of that. You know, I, I live alone and uh, I sort of think that this has been quite a grueling year of multiple lockdowns and relentless bad news. And then trivial as it sounds, I kind of think, yeah, but imagine that without Netflix and Zoom. Um, and so, you know, just trying to sort of cope, cope with only two four TV channels or something would have been tricky. But if we do think about the internet platforms that are keeping us in touch, you know, we've got Zoom, we've got Meet, we've got Teams. They're all private spaces. They're all services. Some of them charges, most of them are free, but none of them are a public space. None of them belong to us. None of them work like the town square. And when you think about the internet, almost nowhere does. And not only are most of these places privately owned and controlled, most of them have a business model we don't really get much of a say in. Most of them rely on the ads model or the data models. And there's not often in a lot of areas a choice. There's not really a search engine as comprehensive and good as Google that you can say, I'll pay you four pounds a month. Um, please don't collect any data about me. And so how have we got an internet that makes so many choices for us and works in a way that generates so many huge, huge companies? The five biggest listed companies in the world are all tech companies. Um, and most of them didn't exist 30 years ago, 40 years ago, perhaps. Um, ultimately, this is a talk about politics and society, not about technology. But it actually starts with technology because we have this slightly strange issue where 
most of the internet was invented by the public sector and most of it is now run and owned and operated by the private sector. Um, and there's sort of two theories of the early internet. One of them is that it was basically a byproduct of some other research projects and grew by accident. And the other is that it was a project of idealists. And I kind of like to think both were right. Um, it was actually funded by ARPANET, um, Dominic Cummings' favorite project, uh, favorite team. But um, ARPANET ultimately wanted to look at networking technologies in the 60s for quite a practical and quite a grim purpose. They were thinking about problems like command and control of nuclear weapons. At the time, phone signals worked in the very traditional way. An, an operator, and it often still would be a human operator, would make a connection between two ends, and that was your phone line. And if that particular cable at that moment snapped, your connection would be gone. Now, if, if the message that you're trying to send is, please launch this nuke, that's quite a big deal. And so the idea of being able to break signals up and have it so they could try multiple routes all at once and provided one worked, sort of brilliant, was a good one. This is sort of a technology called packets and packet switching, and it's still at the core of the internet now. But if you want to test an unproven networking technology, it's probably best that you don't first test it on nuclear warheads. And thankfully they didn't. What they found to test it on was that quite a few universities had computers still the size of a room for their maths, their physics, their chemistry and their engineering departments to use. And people would queue up for time on these computers. They would batch process. And it could be that you might need one set of calculations doing You'd wait 36 hours to get to the front of the queue, get your calculations done, realize you'd sort of punch something wrong in your punch card or typed your instructions wrong and fix that one typo and then have to wait 36 hours again. And so everyone wanted more computers and everyone asked ARPANET for the funding. And instead of saying, um, yes, yeah, sure, you can have more computers, uh, they did something a little bit clever and said, we won't give you money for more computers, but we'll give you money to network the ones you have with a few other universities. And then you can use the computer best suited for the task you want. Some were better for graphical calculating, some for different kinds of calculus, et cetera. And so they could be used more efficiently and they'd be used more quickly. And so this wasn't a super high profile, wonderful, this will change the world project. It was a few universities trying to set up a very practical new kind of technology. And as happens with universities and projects that have funding, but aren't particularly what the senior academics are interested in, it all got turned over to grad students. Um, and this sort of means that most of the people who were there at this birth of the internet, who wrote the first protocols, who were there at the transmission of the first message are still alive and can still talk about it and how it's changed the world. And a lot of the design decisions of the early internet were based on a network that you thought was going to be very like-minded. It was just universities, it was just in America, it was just sort of, if someone was acting about on it, you'd be able to phone their academic supervisor and find out who it was because there'd be about 30 people on the network. So they didn't try and tie security into the early core of the internet. They didn't try and tie in identity to the protocols of the internet. They didn't try and tie in anything like payment or tracking. Um, this has been the strength of the internet, but it's also been what's made it like it is. And to sort of skip many, many middle steps, this lightweight set of protocols that holds things together, we still largely use today. You know, the HTTP in front of the sort of worldwide web bit and web addresses, hypertext transfer protocol has been around since really early on in the birth of the internet. DNS, which is how names match to the IP addresses of your computer has been around for decades. There's a technology to do with how the actual physical cables, which route traffic takes, called Border Gateway Protocol, 
that was quite literally sketched on the back of two napkins at a computer conference in the 1980s. And the two people who sketched it on the back of that napkin kind of went, well, this won't work in the long term, but it might fix things for a year or so. Um, and so, of course, we're still using it today. Um, but what this meant when the internet started to become a consumer product was sometimes you do need to be able to track, is this person the same person? You know, if you want to log into a website to check your email, it has to check, is this the right person? Is this the same person who logged in 30 seconds ago? And because the protocol doesn't have any way of doing that, it puts a little file on your computer, uh, which we call a cookie, which most of us are now familiar with because we have to click 50 times a day saying that we mind or don't mind them being collected. Now, what that means is that particular site can check and go, oh, AZ53X2Z hyphen exclamation marks 5263. I've seen that before. That's the person who successfully logged in as James. Um, that's kind of all the cookie says is that little string of letters. But it means anywhere that that company has something to check a cookie, they can see you, they can track you. And that's how we get followed around the internet. But it's how we log in, it's how we use everything. Payment information works the same way. Everything works like that. But it means anything to do with identity or tracking or sort of logging in or even building sort of data that starts to become the core of community websites. Because of the lightweight design of the internet, because of this idealistic, let's just let the traffic flow and then everything else can work out how to use it, which allowed the internet to adapt so quickly and gain so many uses. Keeping it all light meant that it created these big pools of places with lots of user data. And that's what starts to generate lots of value. Now we tend to talk about this in terms of network effects. And we sort of think we know network effects are when you're on a social network. The sort of a reason that all of us are on Facebook. And it's not generally that all of us go, I really love Facebook. It's a brilliant site. It's so well designed and I always see what I want to see. It's because most people we know are on there. And if someone else started a better site, but only two or three people you knew were on there, you might try and use it for a while and see if you can persuade people. But if you give up, eh, well, you know, I'll, if you don't get them on there, you'll go back to where the people are. And it's why we can't really say just break up Facebook. Let's say we broke up Facebook itself rather than break up Facebook from Instagram or WhatsApp. Um, if you broke Facebook up into 10 different sites, each with 200 million users, would you really sort of find that better? Would you want that? If you're suddenly, you know, you can talk to about a tenth of your friends and everyone else is on the other one, you'd eventually all quit and find one that you were all there on. Come on, buddy, up or down. There's no way he wasn't going to do a cameo. That's the cat. He says, hi. <laughs> Fine. So, um, so that's sort of normally what we think of when we think of network effects, but they actually go way further than that. Google succeeds because of network effects and because of this sort of ability to keep what you can learn from identity and data private. And so Google kind of came to prominence by having a better search algorithm than anyone had had before by kind of ranking pages. It doesn't do it the same way now, but by using sort of the, the density of links and how they were followed instead of older, much cruder ones that literally just counted the number of times a phrase was used on a page, using how often other people linked to it before people knew to kind of play that uh, turned out to be quite a, a good strategy. What they have now is around 30 years of data of what you actually want to look at when you type in sort of any particular phrase. So if I type in pet shop, am I going to click for somewhere to buy cat food in North London? 
or was I actually looking for the pet shop boys and a lazy searcher? Does that change by whether I'm searching in the UK or the US? Does that change late at night? Which result is best? Google has access to billions of searches every hour with where we went next. And someone else could come along with actually a much cleverer algorithm and much more potential. But that huge roster of data and information and connections, that network is private to Google. And so we've kind of built the internet almost as a libertarian fantasy. There's no sort of central authority. There's no centralization of data. There's nothing in the protocols that shares information. But what it's meant is that that data ends up in private hands. And because the internet enables network effects on such a huge scale, because distance doesn't matter, because country doesn't matter, we end up with, in each area, at most two or three huge, huge sites. Now, we could venture, why is that a problem? We get pretty damn good online services at low prices. In general sort of consumer terms, do we overpay for email? Do we overpay for instant messaging? You know, do we suffer from social network? Is YouTube, which, you know, every hour puts up more content than you could ever watch in your life for free, is that robbing us? Is, it, is there a problem to have this kind of imbalance? And if people are offering these services that we all clearly value so much, is it a problem that a few of them get rich? And I could say flippantly, if Mark Zuckerberg is worried about this, then we definitely should be. And Mark Zuckerberg quite publicly is. He has got not just a large shareholding in Facebook, but a controlling shareholding in Facebook. He is one man who ultimately has the final say, not just over one social network with 2 billion daily users, but another one, Instagram, with about 1.8 billion, and a third WhatsApp with very nearly as many. Now, obviously, some of those are the same people, but no one person has ever ever had so much communications control over the world's kind of information system across so many countries. Now, it doesn't seem to me that he wants to try and use it to turn us all into radical communists or neo-libertarians or any particular view in between, but he clearly would have a lot of ability to tweak or nudge the world's population or to set the boundaries of legitimate debate. Just this week, we kind of saw Facebook decided to make an exception for rules saying, I wish X was dead or I would like to kill X if they were a famous person and they weren't added in the post uh, to allow free debate. Seems a very, very questionable, deeply questionable call to me. But the larger problem is it shouldn't lie with one person. You know, Facebook has had for nearly 15 years now a rule that under no circumstances must anyone on Facebook ever be allowed to see a woman's nipple. Um, and that can be in the context of someone trying to sort of do, you know, trouble breastfeeding type videos for new moms. There are no circumstances under which this is content that you can be allowed to see on a network which might otherwise show really quite graphic scenes of violence. These are incredibly difficult moderation choices. These are choices we have traditionally actually left to society or to the people via our governments. And at the moment, our governments are pretending they can't regulate speech because Facebook's global and too big. And Facebook is, to a degree, rightly saying, this should not lie with us. What they're trying to do about it is somewhat insincere in terms of trying to set up its own Supreme Court uh, of the Facebook Oversight Board, etc. But, you know, that's a question. That's just one company in one quite narrow issue, though. 
we're seeing a huge concentration of wealth because of the way the internet is structured. We're seeing huge concentrations of data and people are quite glib and quite, find it quite easy to say data is the new oil. And it's an interesting sort of term. It feels quite profound. It talks about commodification, about value. But the more you think about it, the creepier it gets, because it's a while since I did uh, A-level chemistry, but as I roughly remember it, oil is the kind of the result of the fossilized and crushed up and sort of long decayed remains of aquatic life and plants and everything. You know, it's essentially the essence of millions of years ago, dead life. What is data then, if not the squashed up sort of essence of everything we've ever told a computer about ourselves, everything we've searched for, every connection we have, everything that we sort of ask, every sort of late night confused Twitter search you do, or, you know, that one time that you look up your ex on Facebook, you know, when you maybe shouldn't, but just in that hope that he was doing badly. Um, you know, the data is that in the aggregate. And the current social compact that we seem to have with data is we talk about privacy, we talk about GDPR, that's fine. We can talk about that if people have questions. But I tend to think we talk about data as if it's something that has no value to us personally, but it's okay for companies to make money off. I kind of think of Exxon or someone going into someone's backyard and, you know, whacking a pipe in there and finding oil and going, cool, fantastic. I'm going to take all of this, but I'll get you a Christmas basket every year, like a really nice one. Um, but this oil is worthless to you. You don't know how to refine it. You don't know how to extract it. You don't know how to turn it into any kind of useful product. I mean, it's actually toxic. So just because the oil's on your land, why should you get any value from it? We'll take the oil, we'll give you a little present or two in return, and that's all fine, right? That's not how the oil rush went. We would all find it ridiculous to do that. But just because we don't know how to monetize our individual data, just like most of us wouldn't know what to do with a barrel of crude oil if it landed in our laps, uh, other than stay away, it's really toxic. Um, we let them have all the value for it. And that doesn't seem to me like a social contract that can last or a compact that can last. And so if other people share that discomfort, what do we do about it? And what you see everyone do here, you know, and this is the ones who get the applause. And so people who are on the right side of the fight, these Elizabeth Warrens of the world, say we need to use competition law and break up big tech. Why would that help? How would that possibly help? So if we break up Facebook, we could until recently quite easily break up Facebook because it still worked as three separate companies. You had Facebook, you had Instagram, you had WhatsApp. But let's break those up. You've got a social network with 2 billion people on it, a social network with 1.8 billion people on it, and a social network with 1.8 billion people on it. How are they suddenly now okay just because the company's a little bit smaller? Or we could forcibly break them up, but people would eventually just concentrate back into a bigger one. But this is in an imaginary world where competition law could ever break up Facebook. US competition law in the 20s was amazing. You had the trust busting era, you had the Sherman sort of phase. It was it was how the Gilded Age was ended. It was how the sort of, you know, um, oh gosh, uh, the Rockefellers sort of gouging was ended, all sorts. It was great. US competition law has been neutered by Supreme Court after Supreme Court since then. And the test for US competition law is now, can you prove consumers were directly financially disadvantaged by the lack of competition here? Now, how do you possibly prove that for a service you receive for free? It's impossible for something providing free services to, in a profound way, fail US competition law. 
And the DOJ might go and get 100 million fine here or 200 million fine there for discrepancies in how the shopping's working. It will tinker at the edges. And it's the worst kind of action because it looks like action. It looks decisive and bold. The DOJ in 40 states taking on Facebook or Google or whoever. Phony war means nothing. The EU maybe has more potential. It's the only other block strong enough and with an independent judicial process of you know covering the whole area that's big enough to actually make the challenge and have the companies obey. It's just you know nearly 300 million people, sorry, nearly 500 million people as it is now, too big to ignore. But EU competition law actually is about changing the behavior that violates the law. And you can only recommend breaking up if that would be the only possible way to stop that behavior. As long as the companies and they can put this through successive legal challenge, could demonstrate some lesser remedy, sell off a subdivision, stop an activity, you know, set something up in a not-for-profit, do it at a board, you know, you name it, they could stop themselves being broken up. So competition law, firstly, I don't see how breaking them up doesn't stop the next one coming. But I also think we're desperately... It's like we've got a hammer and we're just desperately looking for a, a nail. You know, people like to talk about the phrase a sledgehammer to crack a nut. That's not what uh, sort of competition law is here. It's like trying to use a sledgehammer to crack the planet. Um, it just won't come close to working. Um, that's even before, just to skip very briefly back to the US bit, we have a 6-3 Republican Supreme Court. I'm not sure they're actually going to set up any laws that could be used more broadly to challenge monopoly power in the USA. So that's why I tend to be a skeptic of competition law. Um, by the time you would have enough power and politics, you know, a 60 seat majority in the Senate, for example, to change competition law enough to reform big tech, why would you not just do it directly? And so the things we could do is go back to that idea early on of these protocols that run the internet instead of the different platforms. Think about when you send an email. If you're on Gmail, you don't have to only email other people on Gmail. That would seem ridiculous. You can email someone on Yahoo, you can email someone who's set up their own server at home. They're all interoperable. You don't have to go onto an O2 mobile phone to phone someone on O2. You can phone a landline, you can phone America, and you can certainly phone someone on T-Mobile. It would seem ridiculous not to. So why can't I message from Twitter someone on Facebook? Why can't I keep my connections on one network when I move to another one? Why do they all jealously guard those connections and those interoperabilities. And it's so that we can't leave. It's so that they're sticky. And so just by changing something like that, you would profoundly change your relationship with these tech companies and your ability to move around, to control them, to sort of set up more open source ones, maybe even public ones. We could also think about sort of how do we manage things like Google's 30 years of search history? And again, that's not exactly a problem we've never had before. If you come up with the idea for a new drug, you get a patent and you get a certain number of years where you, you can monetize that and no one else can. And then you get, it goes off patent and anyone can try and develop it, make it cheaper, use it. Why don't we have equivalents of that for algorithms or for learnings from big data? Why isn't there a sharing element from there? And we could also think about data ownership. Should it be that we get some automatic stake in revenue generated from data about us? I don't think that's technologically impossible. I also don't think it requires a blockchain. I don't think anything requires a blockchain, just for anyone 
thinking about that side of things. Sorry, that might be a bit nerdy for some. Um, I, you know, we've got choices, we've got new ways to think about it, but we often have to think what's the problem we're trying to solve rather than what's the tool we're trying to use. And to sort of come to the end of my sort of talk, I said this was about politics and society, and here's where I really think it is. When we think about the industrial era, it overall, in the end, made us all a lot better off and a lot richer. You know, when I, um, we, we filled out our censuses last weekend, and it was only in 1991 that they last, they, in fact, it was only in 2001, they stopped asking, do you have an indoor toilet? Because through most of the 20th century, that was a relevant question. Lots of people didn't. Fridges were a luxury. You know, when I grew up, central heating was generally a luxury. Fewer people had it than didn't. Uh, yes. Um, it didn't happen by magic. There were all sorts of awful effects. Things got a lot worse for a lot of people on the way. If you were a home tailor, industrialized cloth production, clothes production made your life worse. Um, you had to either be out traded or to go in and work as a factory as a de-skilled worker. Trade unions came out of that. We didn't just get sort of antitrust law, we got trade unions, which started building up workers' rights, which helped us start building health and safety. That sort of income going up helped get us formal education systems. That rising wealth started creating the very basics of a welfare state. We ended up with a 20th century social compact, which we can say got broke towards the end or at different points, but of workers' rights, welfare states, education, healthcare systems, as a result of reactions to industrialization. We are moving from the industrial era. We're moving to an information era, to an automation era. Um, what are the tools? What are the policies that we're going to need for that? That could be anything from universal basic income to politics around algorithmic fairness, to new ways of thinking about welfare, to laws governing data, to yes, new types of antitrust law for a global era. But what strikes me is when people campaigned for these different 20th century policies, they didn't go, all of these different disconnected campaigns, these are because of industrialization. I don't think someone's got to sit down and go, hey gang, let's get together and write the new social contract for the information era. But that's what I think we are going to be doing over the next decade in different fights around populism, in different fights around tech, in different fights about work. That's what we're doing. And we won't do it by looking back at the 20th century tools. It's a long time since we built those ones. We could hopefully learn from them, build from them and make them better. But I think it will be a new settlement. Um, so I will end there, as I see there are already several questions. Um, I will also ask whoever's moderating, do you want to pick them or should I? Um, I'm very happy either way. I just think it looks like a cheat if I pick them. Michael, why don't you pick some questions to start with? Okay, I think there's um, there's a good one actually, which was, um, I see the third question here. Um, can you ever imagine organizations like Facebook or Twitter becoming nationalized or even internationalized into the new public town square? Um, looking at parallels with how train ownership operated in the past. Um, I can't, but that might be a failure of imagination on my part. Um, you know, the US, where they're sort of based, I think would regard it as an act of international aggression if anyone tried to make them UN owned or similar. Um, that said, the UN, the US used to control, for example, ICANN, which controls web domains and handed that over to be a sort of independent international body. So some things on those lines have happened, but what I would think would be more likely would be trying to create some sort of publicly owned rival, but 
generally that's had a fairly bad track record in tech and not been super successful. Um, yeah, I can't see Facebook being nationalized, but it's an intriguing idea. Okay, just I have a question of my own actually to follow up on that is, you mentioned earlier on that um, Facebook, uh, you know, they're, they, they are saying that it's not up to them to regulate themselves to, to an extent. And that um, is, is there ever going to be a chance, given the fact that governments are, you know, the US government and the EU and various are, are, are finding it difficult to agree with each other over who has jurisdiction, essentially, that you could actually have effective regulation of the internet from a content point of view and from you know, policing all the various bad behaviors that we're all very familiar with now? So um, Facebook's playing a fairly clever game, really. They they did for quite a while do the, oh, no one should regulate us. Um, you know, we're fast growing and new and different and it would stymie, you know, change. We're building a new world. They then did the phase two of, well, of course we need regulation and rules, but it's a lot better than it's self-regulation. And they're now in a phase three where, they say, well, of course we want regulation. We always wanted regulation, especially as regulation makes it harder for new competitors. But isn't it silly when we operate in 100 countries to say that we should have to follow 100 different rule books? Can you imagine how hard that would be you know, if only they had tens of billions in which to do it? Um, and so what we really think is sensible is for governments to get together and agree a set of rules. Now, if you can get France, Russia and the US to agree what the limits of speech should be, then you don't just deserve a Nobel Peace Prize. You can sort of probably take over as Pope, Dalai Lama and Sec General of the UN all at once. They know that different countries have norms that are so different they won't get together on it. And so what they're really trying to do with this is make the idea of national regulation ridiculous. And yet we know in practice it works. Germany made its rule on platform responsibility for Holocaust denial much, much stricter. Um, they said if it isn't down within 24 hours, the company's liable. And Facebook suddenly having said this would kill Facebook and they'd have to shut down just hired a few thousand extra moderators and met the law. So governments can regulate nationally, provided they don't make it too onerous. But Facebook would much rather say, doesn't it make more sense to do it internationally? Yes, it does, but it's not going to happen. Okay, I think there was another question about the dissemination of hate speech, but I think you might have actually um, answered quite a lot of that there. Um, about the are there any signs of international efforts to address the dissemination of hate speech and other offensive content? There are there are some elements on that that do work. Um, one of the better international collaborations is about um, tackling images of child abuse, and there's always more that can be done. But quite a lot of law enforcement and a couple of related agencies have very quick uploads to central servers that all the social media companies use that identify variants of thousands of images and take them down as soon as someone tries to put them up and reports the users, including back to those authorities, often so quickly that no one will ever see the image. Um, it's one of the sort of less spoken of success stories but it's a lot easier with material like that than it is with material like hate speech, where the value judgment on when something crosses from, you know, objectionable but allowable in a free society to hate gets incredibly diff difficult to define and there isn't a consensus. Sorry, I cheated there by answering a different question, didn't I? Uh, no, I think it did actually. <laughs> it's, it's just following on. Um, there's a question here from Mark Rainwright: Is how can we effectively campaign for legally enforced open in interoperability standards? Yeah, I mean the problem with this is I think it's something that would completely revolutionise the internet. It's it's not without problems. I should say I'm generally an advocate for it, but it would make it a lot easier for abusive accounts to move across networks. It would make it harder to stamp out hate groups from social media sites. Um, you would have to think carefully about how you applied it. Um, 
but I think it's got a lot of potential too. Um, and the, the good, if we did it right, would outweigh the harm. Um, the best sort of slogan and movement behind it is sort of um, protocols, not platforms. And there's lots of little consortia and lobbying groups and international groups behind it. Um, it ties into work that Tim Berners-Lee, you know, famously the inventor of the World Wide Web, not the internet, that was Vint Cerf, um, uh, ties into work he's doing with the Web We Want. You might cunningly see what he's done with the acronym there, Foundation. Um, the tricky thing is, it's really, really hard to sell it as something that matters to you and me instead of some really technical thing that, you know, should we not leave this to the IT guy? And I'm not sure I've yet cracked a way to make it sound relevant, but it is gaining momentum. It was quite, it was a complete fringe topic sort of four or five years ago. And it's a big part of the internet governance debate now. He says as if internet governance is the sexiest topic on the planet, but you know, it's there. It's moving up, but no, we need more ideas. Okay. Um, question here from Lucy Coombs is, uh, building on what you said about data ownership, do you think that legislation to improve privacy rights can begin to tackle the problems of surveillance capitalism or are privacy rights not sufficient to attempt to de democratize data and information technology? Um, I mean, to take the second half, I'm, I'm going to agree with the, the, the question. I think they're not sufficient. Um, it doesn't mean we shouldn't have them. Um, it is better to have privacy protections than not to, and it's far better to have rights to access your own data for accountability, et cetera. But it just starts to see it in a narrow privacy or rights frame. It stops it sort of suggesting that you have commercial rights over your data or ownership rights over your data or, you know, copyright over your data. You know, there's sort of all sorts of other spaces around exploitation that mean we need to think of it more broadly. And the thing that I worry about is because the privacy framing is so sort of strong and is so familiar, it moves us off the monetization thing quite a long way. And I tend to sort of notice Google is increasingly happy to talk about privacy and has quite good private browsing tools built into Chrome and into its own things. And it's sort of like, you know, it's the, the avenue that the bigger respectable companies are happier to go down now. Apple makes a selling point of protecting privacy. Uh, Google sort of is, is leaning on it. It's a framing that sort of suits the tech companies because they can go, you know, you're making informed choices now. We're protecting you from the sort of bandits who'd invite, invade your privacy. Otherwise, this model of capitalism, this online model works. Um, so that's not to say throw out GDPR, although I really could happily never get another pop-up notification ever again. Uh, <laughs> hate them. But, uh, you know, it, it has its place. It's just a solution to quite a small problem and quite a different one from that broader surveillance capitalism one. Um, I think most of us here would have heard about the Australia Facebook standoff, but maybe for answering it, you might have a little bit of background on that. Um, does the, do you think that the recent Australia Facebook standoff can tell us anything about the relative power of countries and companies and where there might be future conflicts? And I suppose how, how that might work, play out. So, um, so as, as a working journalist, especially someone who freelances a day a week on top of my day job, I should probably frame this as um, nasty tech companies have been stealing journalist content and making money off it since forever. And some heroic newspaper groups pluckily gathered together and persuaded the government to basically menace the search engines into whacking a huge new tax on them if they didn't compensate um, these news sites for links. Unfortunately, that would be talking total, insert expletive here. 
Um, news outlets have a habit of thinking Facebook owes them money and Google owes them money. And it's because we used to make a lot of money from classified adverts. You know, 30 years ago, 35 years ago, if you wanted to buy a house, you bought your local paper. If you wanted to buy a car, you bought your local paper. Uh, if you wanted to date and you were shy, you might buy your local paper and look at the personals. The internet came along and came up with better ways to search for all of these things. That revenue was not lost because someone exploited the papers or was nasty or it was someone had a better idea. Uh, the Guardian has a billion endowment because the Guardian thought of putting Auto Trader online and actually made some money from it. Um, papers tend to confuse that legitimate loss of advertising revenue with looking at how rich Google and Facebook are and sort of putting two and two together and making 20. And so generally, the logic of the internet has been, it is a nice thing to link to someone. It is a good thing to do. It helps your readers get your sourcing. It credits people. It helps traffic get through there. News sites rely on Facebook for traffic. They want their news shared on there. They write their headlines for it. We rely on Google for traffic. And so Google puts little headlines and summaries in news. Facebook, if someone chooses to share it, puts it there. What the preposition ended up being with Australia was if one of our users shares one of our stories on Facebook, you should pay us for that, which doesn't intrinsically feel reasonable to me and feels against the logic of the internet. And Facebook tried to make this argument and lots of people who usually don't like Facebook, including me, but lots of people who are far more credible on all of this than me. In fact, I think Tim Berners-Lee chipped in on this one too. Jimmy Wells certainly did, and he is not a Facebook sort of fanboy, said this breaks the internet. Um, and so Facebook eventually said, okay, you think we're stealing from you when we include previews and share these links. You say we have to pay you even if a user puts one on the site. That's okay. If you think we've been ripping you off, we'll stop showing any news. And, uh, and we'll stop letting people share news links. And this turned into Facebook does news blackout. It's like, no, it doesn't. Anyone can still go to any news page. It's just you couldn't choose to share the thing there. And at which point the news outlets, if they had been remotely honest in saying Facebook's been stealing from us by doing this, would have gone, great, thank you. Instead, they went into absolute lurid censorship, panic, outrage, end of days, the sky is falling. Um, and so the new rule seemed to then ask for, you must pay us every time someone shares something on your site and you must allow them to share things on your site. Um, at which point you're not asking for a fair deal, you are just doing a shakedown. Uh, it was an absolutely shameful little shakedown. Um, and what inevitably happened was um, Facebook and Google, as they'd always been intending to, paid some money to the big newspaper companies for not quite for what they were asking for, but found tangentially related things to do. Everyone backed down a bit from the law and signed a voluntary code and people got paid off. It's completely grubby. It, me it makes the papers untrustworthy when they cover tech uh, and it mainly benefits generally quite negligent corporate owners who often contribute to the worst misinformation on Facebook anyway. Um, so the whole I think thing we all know who you mean. Utterly unedifying um, and everyone comes out of it badly. Um, but where it comes to should Facebook or Google fund news, if that was the core of the question, no. If we think news needs to subsidy and is a public good, what we should do is tax Facebook and Google properly and get their money into general taxation and separately work out good, if we think public subsidy for media is appropriate, good, fair ways to do that. 
that don't allow the government to pick favoured outlets, etc. And if that starts making us feel very uncomfortable, allowing Facebook to work out who it subsidises should make us feel just as uncomfortable too. So I don't think we should try and dodge the hard debate there. Not that I'm suggesting the question was saying we should. Actually, I think you hit on something there with the tax situation, which probably relates to the question about the, the fact that our data is a commodity as well as being used. And, um, and perhaps even links into the wider, the older discussions about charity versus um, taxation. And, you know, is, is Facebook almost acting like a, a Victorian charitable benefactor deciding which of the... Uh, which who's going to benefit from their largesse in, in a sense. It, it, it absolutely is. I mean, they, they do give out quite a lot of money to media. I'm pretty sure both Facebook and Google have funded parts of my organization's local news. Um, I don't see a conflict when it comes to local news, but I cover big tech. I, I would not take funding from them for my teams, um, but they did when the, the Europe was suggesting various regulations, one of their submissions did say, you know, we might, if you pass these laws, struggle to uh, continue our support of local news across Europe, uh, which again turns into, you know, nice charitable funding you have there, be a shame if anything bad happened to it. Um, so yes, you know, these are large profit maximizing corporations. If they're giving hundreds of millions away, they're doing it for a reason. I've got a short question here from um, Mohammed. Sorry, I can't see the end of his name there. Um, uh, who, who, who are responsible for the fake accounts that encourage other people to change their opinion, especially on the online news pages? So this, this, one, is, this one is a tricky one because it varies. Um, one of the big lessons I learned spending years covering online misinformation is there is no scientific way to separate for certain um, a prolific Russian Twitter bot from a, twi a particularly Twitter active British pensioner. Um, there is a certain style among some pensioners of tweeting that just really, really seems quite familiar to bot accounts. People will copy and paste. People will have quite long hours on there, be very active in debates um, and use tools a bit differently from an average user in their 20s or 30s, say. Um, and there was one particular account which was identified on the front page of a newspaper as the most prolific Russian bot working in the UK. And it turned out to be a pensioner living on the outskirts of Edinburgh. And he was very much a real man. And <laughs> I don't think he'd ever been to Russia. He just cared a great, great, great deal about issues around Scottish independence. Um, and so there are bots being operated from St. Petersburg and from other places. It's a fairly low rent operation and its goal is generally to make you divided. Um, Russian bots are just, in fact, even more likely to talk about immigration or culture wars as they are about Brexit. Whatever gets people angry, they'll tweet a lot of anti-Islam content because that really sets people going. Um, they'll tweet on trans rights because that really sets people off. Anything that divides people and gets a shouting match there is great. But what they want is it's a very low key bit of zero sum. And one of the best sort of reactions they can have is getting people constantly asking each other, are you a bot? Uh, I am talking about the Surkov doctrine, yes. Um, you know, it's a very zero sum idea that just if we're divided and weaker, you know, if we sink, they rise. Um, but it is how this operates. Um, and so generally, other people operate bots as well. Sometimes there are sort of private botnets for hire. There are little ones around the place. But generally, the best sort of thing I find is to acknowledge they exist. And if you suspect someone might be one, just not to engage with it. Um, you know, mute. Mute is your friend. I almost never block. I love muting because if someone's shouting at you, 
they don't even know you can't see or hear them anymore. It's a complete delight. Um, you know, mute early, mute often, focus on the people who are having the good version of the argument. You know, I have no problem with being disagreed with on the internet or I'd never be able to use it. Um, but it's so easy to let people drag you down to the really nasty reductive stuff. And a lot of the people doing that are unfortunately real live humans who are probably otherwise lovely people. Not the racists, they, they're pretty awful. Happens to prove the real. Um, actually, that, that brings on to another question. Somebody here, probably one of our lighter questions, um, especially the the uh, um, the retired Scot opinionated Scot Scottish um, person you mentioned earlier. Is that sometimes a question from? Hang on, get the name here. Hugo Tyson is sometimes to read that uh, boomers uh, use Facebook and Snapchat. A uh, gener generation X use Snapchat, young adults WhatsApp, etc. And do you think a sort of fashionable rolling over to new platforms should be encouraged to do the, the sort of things we desire um, without the older, fatter company, Facebook, just buying them all? Um, yes. I mean, the, the Facebook problem of the buying them all is the issue there. So it seems quite nice that TikTok has absolutely no intention so far of doing it. Um, big tech kind of has so much money on its hand, it almost makes it too appealing not to. The WhatsApp owners clearly didn't like Facebook and didn't want to be bought by Facebook. But you can hate and hate and hate, and then $18 billion and $3 billion of it going to you personally. You know, we've, we could all turn down $2 billion. We, We've all probably done it this week, but $3 billion starts to add up. You know, you could probably buy a small ha house in London on that. Um, so, you know, it is tricky, but the good thing is, it is that natural cycle and it is that natural succession. Um, you know, I do remember seeing headlines in about 2005, six, when Facebook had already launched. I have had a Facebook account, you know, will MySpace ever be beaten kind of thing or why it won't be everything looks a completely unassailable monopoly until it isn't. Um, Facebook's been acutely aware of that, which is why it owns two of the others. But, you know, Snapchat was going to be it for a while, and then Instagram sort of tore it back. You've got TikTok now. The one good thing is no one ever wants to be on the thing that their parents is on, or even, frankly, their sort of uncle. So another one will come. Um, and if we can sort of, if we can just tackle tech a little bit so that they don't have, you know, $50 in cash, $50 billion in cash piles like Apple does, you know, we might actually discourage them buying up all the new rivals too. I just wonder if we can encourage innovation by destroying the cool of various platforms. <laughs> oh, just make it now. Like, get, get sort of Boris Johnson or something to go out and say how much he loves TikTok. And like, you know, get Boris Johnson to do a TikTok meme and everyone's off it overnight. Okay, um, let's go to questions again. Um, I had one just popped in. Uh, uh, do you think there will be a retreat from using platforms as the new town square because they're just too toxic and rarely helps people's causes? It's addictive and they're there have been campaigns against addictive devices in the, in the past. I mean, you have seen, you heard about digital detox, and I guess the last year has probably changed that a bit. But um, what's, what's next, do you think? So I, I'm generally, for all that I think they're immensely flawed, I think too often when we complain about social media, we're actually complaining about people. Um, people radicalise each other. We have in-groups. Um, I think if anything, you know, social media has made us angry because it's broken us out of our filter bubbles. Uh, you tend to live in a place where people are of a similar class to you. Uh, your friends tend to be a similar occupation to you and tend to generally agree with you on stuff. Pre-internet, if you sort of bought a paper, you bought one a day. Um, you could comfortably sort of tell yourself most people kind of agreed with you and it was only the odd idiot that didn't. Um, you know, nothing is sort of a, a better filter bubble than a village in the sort of Cotswolds. 
uh, the internet has brought us all a bit closer to each other and made it a lot clearer that we disagree on lots of things. We read a wider variety of news sources every day than we ever used to. We're better informed than we ever used to be, and we're actually better connected to each other than we used to be. And that's not to kind of conjure an image of the Coke advert with us all sort of happily singing on a hill, holding hands or whatever. It's kind of going, this is probably as good as it's ever got. Um, and so I tend to think when we look at social media, there are addictive practices that are bad. There are ways it can pull you into extremism. There is more that we can do. But I tend to think it's one of those where it's like when people, you know, in the 18th and 19th century complained about the effects of novels on women's brains or bicycles on their fertility. Um, you know, it's sort of as worrying a little bit about new technology, when it's actually just what the new technology reminds us about our current social norms or our current interactions. I think social media is unpleasant at the moment because society is polarised rather than, you know, social media has polarised society. That's a... Just following on from there's actually a question that's been sitting here a little while. I think it's a good time to go to it because I think it, it has the whole as good as it gets uh, element here. Is a, a few days ago on BBC Radio 4, there's an interesting program on the topic when robots can do um, nearly every current human job, what will we do? And so, uh, evidently, there's a team thinking about that now. And how does how much does that overlap with the question on ownership um, that we were discussing earlier today? So, I mean, I, I'm assuming we get broken down for component parts. Um, no, I mean, we've always had something come along and replace every job a human can do. And then we've always found more things to do. You know, I, it's sort of easy to kind of go, well, once upon a time, 98% of us worked in agriculture. Now it's 2%. You don't see what's going to come next at that moment. Um, the question was phrased a little bit more cleverly than that, in that it said when they can do everything we can do. Um, economics would tell us comparative advantage, we would still find things to do. And provided we'd worked out ways to share, share the spoils and share the wealth, we would still have a benefit from that. You know, we still, anyone now can buy a glass that is made very well by a machine you will pay five times to 10 times as much to buy a handmade one. Um, and so we already live in a world where lots of tasks that can be done by machine are also done by man. And there are still different human, I should say. It felt very overly strong that um, are done by human. Um, it feels like we don't know how that society will look and where the roles will be. But I don't think we suddenly hit a point where everyone's going, oh no, there's literally no jobs anymore. I think it will all morph and all change. Just a little bit like, you know, as agriculture jobs disappeared, manufacturing jobs, let me stress, manufacturing jobs, not manufacturing, disappeared because factories are now so automated. Places that used to have 500 staff now manage on 50. Um, those people tend to be in service jobs now because it turns out as we got more affluent, we prefer eating fast casual, we eat out more, we do more things like that. Yes, you can start to see automation come in there too, but something else will come. Um, that's not saying we shouldn't do all sorts of things to help that transition, to think about that transition and to try and think further ahead on what to do where we could be in a world where all sorts of jobs are gone. You know, I it was before my time, I sort of look at the 80s, and I, I know from textbooks and television, you know, the miners' strikes, that kind of era. You can't help but look and think the end of coal was inevitable. What wasn't inevitable was the end of coal, meaning the end of those communities and the end of those people's sort of meaningful working lives. Uh, and the transition was made so callous and so aggressive and so 
hostile, that's the bit you can manage. We, can't, we won't be able to stop automation ending some occupations. We will be able to manage it a lot better. But that does mean being on the front foot. It does mean being compassionate. It does mean changing our view of people who lose their jobs. We still weirdly, you know, where does the grace period go between you being someone who's lost your job through no fault of your own because your company folded to you being an unemployed layabout? Because in the way the media does it, it feels to me to be about six weeks. Sorry, that was a completely unrelated rant. <laughs> <end>. <laughs> Well, I was just going to say we've we've passed the top of the hour now, so we probably ought to um, begin to think about uh, wrapping up. Um, I wondered if I could maybe just get in a a, a final ish question, um, which, which was just to ask whether um, you think James are there are there things that we as individuals can do in terms of our consumer choices um, that can help to redress the balance in terms of power, our power in relation to big tech. So, you know, I'm thinking about things like choosing different search engines or not going on Facebook. Is, is there any purpose to that? Or, or do we really have to look to government level regulation? Um, it's, I'll answer in two parts. I think generally, if you want societal change or systems change, act as a citizen, don't act as a consumer you know, help, you know, donate to one of the sort of online rights and tech rights and civil rights groups really struggle for money or for volunteer power or for people to help them with MPs. You know, it's not not the fashionable charity if you're doing a fun run. Things like that can help even more than sort of signing petitions, etc. So advocacy is the thing that's going to make the change. It's like climate change, you know, you're not really going to do something washing at 30 rather than 40 to save the planet, doesn't mean you shouldn't do it. Um, where you might want to make the changes as a consumer are working out the trade-offs for yourself. And I don't know how much I've raised my arms around, but people might notice I'm wearing an Apple Watch. Um, I write and think about privacy and have for more than a decade. And generally, because I wrote about surveillance and got on so many watch lists, it was ridiculous during Snowden, I kind of gave up on the idea of privacy for myself. And so I use Google, I run Twitter in public, I sort of do all of this. Because of what I work, I'm quite careful with things like my address. But um, generally, I've decided for me, these trade-offs are worth it. They might not be for you. You might not want to sort of use these things. I do use ad blockers. I check my sort of, I use a selective one that lets nice adverts through <laughs> because, you know, adverts save my industry, pay my bills and, you know, keep my cats in food. Um, but those choices are meaningful choices for you as an individual and you as a consumer. So if you want to make them for your sake, they are perfectly sensible choice and there's all sorts of alternatives out there. And they are trade-offs. You know, DuckDuckGo, famously the sort of private search engine, isn't as good as Google if you're trying to find something in a hurry. Um, but sometimes it's quite interesting just to see what it throws up that's different. And it is usable, it works. So you can make that choice. You can choose to always browse on private mode. You can choose not to use single sign-on. Um, all of those are, are good to make, but I would say make those choices for you. If you want to make choices to change the overall picture of it, do that through citizenship. Don't do it through consumerism. Thank you, James. Um Paul, I was thinking we'd probably wrap up there. Is that does that look reasonable? I think so. I mean, there is one more question, but um, I think maybe we can leave that for another day. Um, unless if anyone's got a really burning one that they want to hear from, send it to me on Twitter or on email, and I, I'm quite happy to sort of answer any final ones. Yeah, we'll do that. <laughs> great, great. Okay, James, that's been fantastic. Uh, feel free to give a last plug for the book. Um, yes, it is the system, who owns the internet and how it owns us. 
it, it got some good reviews, I hope. So um, please do give it a try. Uh, certainly, if you sat through that talk and if, if you enjoyed bits of it, I, I think and I hope you would like it. So uh, please do feel free to give it a go. Great, thank you. Um, Paul, did we have any Cambridge for Europe announcements to finish with? Um, not at the moment, I don't think. Um, we're going to have a little bit of a break over the um, over the Easter break and hopefully then be announcing some more talks um, in late this spring and all into the summer. And maybe even some real world events getting away from our computers and, <laughs> and back into the actual town halls and, <laughs> and the town squares. So, yeah. Great. Great. Thank you, Paul. Um, James, thanks again. And thank you, everybody, for attending. Thank you all. Thanks very much.